All right, well, let me uh, just read the, the verse we're looking at this evening, which is uh, James chapter 1, verse 12. So dealing with one verse will give us an opportunity to go perhaps a little bit uh, more deeply into it, but the way this is structured, it's, it's a complete idea in and of itself, and I think important enough to, to single out and, and to look at more carefully. So James writes this in verse 12, chapter 1, blessed is a man who per perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So let's take a look at uh, what the Lord is telling us through, the, um, uh, through James, uh, the Lord's brother, uh, this evening. Now remember, James has already told us a few things. He's told us that the Lord will send trials. And he's told us why, that these trials are intended to help us grow more into uh, the image of Christ, really, which is why we should rejoice when he sends them, uh, not because of the difficulty, it's hard to rejoice in difficulties, but because of the good that he's going to work through those difficulties, through those trials. James has also told us how we can get the wisdom we need from God to make the best use of the trial. He's told us that if we ask, God will give it to us generously, but we have to ask him without any doubting. And I think perhaps, you know, if we have difficulty here, we're going to have difficulty uh, receiving anything from the Lord because James has just told us God will give it to us. He's made this promise, and whatever God has promised, he will follow through on. We can know that. So we can ask without doubting. And then James dealt with two trials in particular, that of poverty and, and that of prosperity. If we have little, James says, we should rejoice because that little makes us depend on God more. And the more we depend on Him, uh, the more we're going to be led to or receive higher honor in His kingdom. You know, having little humbles us. It allows us to serve others. It makes us depend on Him more and trust in Him more. And as we trust in Him more and ask Him for more things and see the answers to those prayers, our faith will grow. So it, it helps us in many different ways. At the same time, He said, if we don't have much, we can also be thankful because those with riches are tempted to depend more on their wealth than they, are, than, than they would depend on God. And uh, James reminded us that in the end, the rich are going to discover that that which they depended on is going to do them no good. Jesus said, what would it profit us if we gained the whole world but lose our souls? Because the wealth of the world cannot purchase our souls, okay? Only Christ can. We need to trust in Him. Now, we did see the Lord sometimes blesses believers with wealth but only when he knows that it will not stumble them and that they will use that wealth for his glory. But it's a rare thing because the Lord wants us to depend on him. Why? That's why Jesus says, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now this evening, James tells us why it's important to persevere through the trials that the Lord brings into our lives. And he says, because it's only then that we will receive the crown of life. So we want to understand what, what all this means tonight. Now James begins with this, this statement, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. Now it's been pointed out that in saying this, James is reflecting something that we see throughout Scripture and certainly something we see in the New Testament, the idea of beatitude, right? The idea of wisdom. Um, those who Embrace wisdom, those who do the wise thing uh, are going to be happy. And that's what blessed means. It means to be happy. To be happy because of something that is gained, something good, something we can enjoy. Now, in this case, James is referring, and we're going to see this a little bit later, to the best possible something that we can gain, and that is heaven. That's what he means by the crown of life. But we know that God's blessings 
are contingent, okay? They are always contingent, ultimately on Christ. But we know that there are certain conditions that we must meet in order to gain the blessing, in order to gain this happiness. Now, again, that's something that is, is we see over and over again in Scripture, that there are conditions to the blessings uh, that the Lord has for us. So let me give you a few examples. In Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, listen to what the psalmist writes. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Now notice here that happiness is contingent. It's conditional on not walking in the path of the wicked, which means not living in rebellion, not being disobedient to the Lord, but rather delighting in God's law, meditating on God's law, doing God's law. And then he goes on to talk about the blessings that are ours if we will do that. Solomon tells us in Proverbs 3, verse 13, that happiness comes from knowing God's wisdom and living according to it. He says, how blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. By the way, he's saying exactly the same thing the psalmist just said. Isaiah tells us that happiness comes from observing the Sabbath. By the way, I was, I was talking with someone this morning about the Sabbath, and I didn't include this because of that conversation. I had already had this in, in, in my notes, in case they happen to be listening tonight. But Isaiah says that happiness comes from observing the Sabbath, as well as observing all the commandments. Uh, Isaiah 56, verse 2, How blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who takes hold of it, who keeps from profaning the Sabbath, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Now again, notice that really the psalmist in Psalm 1, Solomon in Proverbs 3, Isaiah, have all said exactly the same thing. Blessing comes from obedience to the Lord. And then, of course, when we think of blessed, we, we can't help but think about you know, the, the rather full list that Jesus gives us in the Beatitudes. And here, are, again, are a few challenges, a few uh, conditions that need to be met before we are blessed, before we are happy. He first of all says happiness comes through humility. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It comes through grieving over our sins and the sins of others. Blessed are those who mourn. From being kind and considerate to others, blessed are the gentle. From wanting to do the right thing, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. From showing compassion and mercy to others, blessed are the merciful. From overcoming our sins, blessed are the pure in heart from helping others to reconcile with one another. Blessed are the peacemakers. And um, from becoming so much like Jesus that the world sees it and hates us for it. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Now again, all these things point to the same thing. All of these things point to blessed are those who obey the law of God. Blessed are those who are like Jesus, okay? We are happiest, Jesus is telling us, when we are most like Him, when we love and obey as He did. And I think, I think we found that, I hope we found that to be true in our own lives. When we see Christ-like virtues being formed in us, that makes us the most blessed, the happiest we can possibly be because we are like the one whom we love. Now, James is telling us in our passage that happiness or blessedness also comes from persevering under trial. That when the trial comes, we, we don't fall away. That we don't respond in the wrong way, trying to avoid the trial by avoiding our duty. Sometimes duty leads us you know, into a situation that is difficult, and that's a trial. And we don't avoid the trial by going around it. We have to go through it. So we respond in the right way and we go through it. 
And we don't also fall away by becoming vindictive or perhaps wanting to seek revenge if that trial should be somebody injures us in some way. But rather, we endure it. Perseverance means to endure. It means to stand firm. It means to make it to the end. And again, we just need to look at the Lord Jesus Christ, whose entire life was actually a trial, wasn't it? Because he lived among a sinful people who hated him. But no matter what they threatened him with, no matter what they did to him, he continued to persevere, even all the way to the cross. If we can endure the trial, then we are blessed because we are becoming more like Christ. Now remember, trials are meant to show us something about ourselves, right? It's meant to test us whether our faith is genuine or not genuine. If we can endure, we have a genuine faith. If we can't, we don't. We're merely thorny or stony ground hearers, as Jesus put it in the parable of the sower. We only follow Jesus when it's convenient or abandon him when we find something we want more. Blessed is the man who endures the, the trial, who perseveres through it. Now, why does James say that we're blessed if we endure? Well, he's already encouraged us that we should rejoice when the Lord brings trials into our lives because they are meant to help us grow stronger. But here he says that if we endure, and of course the Lord is building this endurance in us through the trials, we're blessed, he says, because we'll receive the crown of life. Now, you've likely, as I have, as you read through the Bible, you know, you read about certain crowns that the Lord promises to give uh, to his faithful people. Paul speaks of the crown of righteousness. Peter of the crown of glory. James here speaks of the crown of life, and so did John in the passage I read at the beginning, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And perhaps we wondered with all these crowns, how are they all going to fit <laughs> on our heads, right? <laughs> well, the fact is we don't have to worry because these are not literal crowns. The crown of righteousness is righteousness. The crown of glory is glory. And the crown of life is life. I hope you're not too disappointed. I thought maybe you were going to have a stack of crowns on your head. James is, is basically telling us that if we endure, if we persevere, the Lord will reward us with a crown. Now, he's not saying that through our own endurance, in our own strength, the Lord will reward us with the crown. But he's saying that if we are able to stand, if our faith proves to be genuine, it shows that we are the heirs of eternal life and we will enter into eternal glory. The same thing is true with all of these conditional blessings. And again, think of the Beatitudes, okay? Why are we blessed if we're humble? Jesus says, because the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. The humility shows that you have a genuine faith. You've trusted in Christ. You have the Spirit. He's working this virtue in you. Why are we blessed if we mourn for sin? Because we will receive the comforts of heaven. Why if we're gentle? Because we're the heirs of, of, of the earth, the new heavens and the new earth, not this old sin-cursed one. Why, if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, because we will be satisfied with the perfection of heaven? Why, if merciful, because we'll receive God's mercy and his forgiveness and his acquittal on that day, uh, we will enter into glory? Why, if pure in heart, because the Lord says we will see God, we will see the beatific vision? Why, if peacemakers? We'll prove that we are God's children, the heirs of heaven, even as our Lord Jesus, who came to preach peace to those who are far and, and near. And why if persecuted? Again, because the eternal kingdom belongs to us. Now again, Jesus is not saying that we're going to receive these blessings because we have cultivated these virtues on our own. We've, we've worked up these things in our own strength and we've, we've finally reached the mark of humility or gentleness or whatever it may be. What he's saying is the fact that we have these virtues shows 
that we are God's children, that we are Christ's brethren, that we already possess these blessings through the Lord Jesus Christ by faith in Him. Christians, true believers, will be different than they were before. They will be different from the world. They will be like Jesus. And in the same way, James is not telling us here that we receive eternal life because we endure, as though we're doing this on our own, in our own strength, but rather our endurance through a trial shows that we already have this eternal life in Christ, that the crown of life belongs to us. Now, finally, why will we persevere through these trials? What's going to give us the strength to do this? Remember, I told you it all boils down to one thing. It always does, and it's love. Love is what enables us to endure. Love is that mark, that sign, that evidence that the kingdom of heaven belongs to us. Listen to what James writes again in this one verse. He says, blessed is the one who, per who perseveres through the trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You see, the reason why we endure is that we love him, and I believe that's what James is telling us here. We hold on to what we love, and particularly what we love the most. For believers, that's the Lord. And that's why nothing in heaven or earth can ever separate us from Him. Our perseverance through the trial proves that we love Him, that we have a faith that works by love, that we've really taken hold of Jesus with the kind of faith that justifies, that is created by the Spirit. But remember as well that you know, what we've seen in the mornings, that even this spirit-created love needs to be nurtured, doesn't it? Because what is the source of our failures in, in every area? Our failure to obey the Lord, our, our failure to endure the trials. You know, we've all failed to one degree or another when we've gone through trials. We haven't conducted ourselves, you know, absolutely perfectly. And the reason is because our love for Christ wasn't strong enough. If we want to stand firm without wavering, that love needs to be strengthened. And again, that's what we've been looking at in, in the morning. We need to use the means God has given to us to strengthen that love. We need to seek the Lord through His Word and prayer. We need to walk with Him in the light, live by the Word that, that He has revealed to us by the wisdom that He has revealed to us, again, like the Lord Jesus. Now, what I'd like to do is, is close with just a couple of, of quotes, about a paragraph long each, that, that tells us something about how we should be striving. And this comes from uh, the Puritans. And the first quote comes from actually Joseph Allen, who may technically be a Scottish Presbyterian. But... He says this, that we must strive for perfection even though we know that we will never reach it. As we're thinking about, you know, the, how much effort are we supposed to put into this, into growing in, in this love? How, how obedient should we strive to be? Well, Joseph Allen is going to tell us that we need to strive after the, the highest level. Okay, this is what he writes. You should aim at perfection of holiness and no mark short of perfection should limit or bound your aims. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, Having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So how much, you know, how, how much are we seeking to clean our lives up? Cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. How holy should we be? perfectly holy. He goes on to say, though perfect holiness cannot be attained, at least in this life, yet it must be aimed at. Though we cannot reach unto it, yet we must be reaching towards it. 
Though we cannot obtain, yet we must be still following after. Because we cannot obtain all that is desirable, but there will be still while we live something that is before, which we are yet short of. Therefore, our motion, that is our progress in religion, must be constantly a progressive motion. We must still be going forward and reaching out to that which is before, that our works may be more and our heart may be better at last than at first. The path of the just must shine more and more unto perfect day. Grace must be growing up till it be swallowed up of glory. So first of all, we should be striving for perfection. Um, blessed are those who, again, uh, don't walk in the way of the wicked, but they delight in the law of God, meditate on it, and do it. This is just simply another way of putting that same thing. The standard that God puts out before us is a standard of perfection. And he was saying all believers will and must aim towards that and nothing less. And then secondly, we have to do it faithfully. Okay, no matter what we have to face. And we will do it if we have God's spirit. If he has shown us his glory. Or as the Puritans put it, and Jonathan Edwards, perhaps one of the, his favorite uh, words that he uses when it talks about our relish of God, we find in God a certain sweetness that makes us keep coming back for more. Okay? And Jeremiah Burroughs, uh, I know you, you gals have gone through one of his books of late, uh, uses the same kind of terminology, but listen to what he writes. He says, surely it is not in vain to seek God. For there never were any faithful seekers that ever would leave off, but would continue as long as they lived seeking God. They would seek his face evermore. If it had been in vain, they would have left off. When we see a bee stick on a flower and will not be driven off, or if she be driven off, she will come again, we conclude certainly that she finds honey there. So all the saints of God that have ever sought God truly would never be beaten off this way. Let the world do what it will. Persecute them. Set spies to watch them in their prayer meetings. Let it punish and imprison them. Let all the malice and rage of men be against them. Yet they cannot hinder them either from praying in their closets or from enjoying the benefit of the communion of saints in prayer. Daniel had rather lose his life than be kept from his prayers, though but for a day, yes, three times a day, as he was accustomed. He would not forbear one time. He did stick to prayer, finding honey and sweetness in it. Oh, how unlike we are to Daniel, though the performance of this duty was exceedingly hazardous to him, yet he would not be deterred from it. So the point is, we're only going to find this happiness, this blessedness by pursuing the one we love, pursuing Christ-likeness. And everything that I've mentioned, every, every example of blessed are you if you do this, blessed are you if you do that, is simply explaining to us what Christ is like. James tells us in this case, if we are blessed, if we persevere through a trial, because if we persevere through the trial, we know that our faith is real and we know that in the end, we will receive the crown of life. We will receive eternal life. Well, may the Lord grant that we would uh, persevere. Well, let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, um, let's ask the Lord to give us grace to do so.